Welcome to another episode of our series on Pirkei Avot. We're now on chapter 2, Mishnah 4. And as usual, we'll de- dedicate this episode in memory of uh, uh, Levi ben Moshe ben Esther and Elisheva Yael Bat Lev Levi. Uh, and uh, without any further ado, let's hand over to Michael. Thank you, Bat Mashiach. So, yes, so the fourth uh, Mishnah in this uh, Perek um, again deals with um, uh, deals with Rabbi Gamliel, who is uh, the son of Rabbi Yudha Anasi, who tells us um, Hu Haya Omer Ase Uetsono Kutsonecha. Um, he used to say, do his will as though it were your own. So that he will do your will as though it were his. Um, uh, Set aside your will in the face of his will, inferring to Hashem, so that he may set aside the will of others for the sake of your will. So this is quite a perplexing statement. What mm. does he mean by this? Make, make, your, uh, make Hashem's will like your will? Make your will like Hashem's will? How is this? Back, uh, scratch my back and I'll scratch yours with Hashem? What does this talk? Um, this is very interesting. There are a lot of interpretations of this. Um, I will um, give you Rabbeinu Yonah's commentary on make Hashem's will your own. Just as when a person does his own will with want and desire, so should he do the will of Hashem, HaKadosh uh, Baruch Hu, and he should not separate between the will of Hashem and his own will, but rather make both of them into one thing. He means to say that he should not will anything that is not the will in front of God. And they said in the Avos to Rav Noson, referring to uh, Midrash in Mishle, chapter 9, and I quote, And so did David say, But all is from you, and it is from your hand that we have given to you. Uh, end quote. And he gave a good counsel to people to overcome their nature and um, and do the desire of Hashem. Also, from their money and from the acquisitions, because Hashem gave everything. And what they have is only deposited into their own hands. And when one brings this up into his heart, at the very least, he will do the will of the owners, which is Hashem, with the deposit that Hashem ultimately gave man. And with this, he will not worry when he gives charity, and he will do the will of Hashem willingly and with a good heart. Uh, And he continues also with the statement in the Mishnah, so that he will make your will like his will. Hashem may uh, Hashem satiates the will of every living thing and gives bread to all flesh and to every creature according to its lack. And this is his want and his will. If you And if you merit to find favor in front of him, he will do your will also with the needs of your small world and give you your sustenance, which is actually his will for all that come into the world. This is very interesting. Rabbi Nuyona has um, given that commentary, but I'd like to give my own analogy and and um, perhaps this makes sense of uh, make your will his will. Let's take a very, very simple example of uh, uh, in nature, you have a, in your garden, you may have birds, wild birds that live in the surrounding trees. If you do a simple thing, like fill a bird seed feeder, and place it in a tree, offer it to the local wild birds. This perhaps may be a far greater mitzvah than you ever imagine. And your matan as we discussed earlier in the first Mishnah, instead of you thinking this is a simple act of me just uh, 
laying out a plate or a feeder of seeds, what you could be doing is one of the greatest things you can do for Hashem. What, 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 what does this mean? We learn in Bereshis that Hashem charges the animals of the world with the commandment of Puru or Ruvu. That's all they have to do. That's all the uh, MO for the animal world is Puru or Ruvu. Go forth and multiply. Now, if you consider that when a wild bird, um, the, when they have their mating season and they produce a clutch of eggs or a nest full of eggs, they can sometimes produce approximately six to eight eggs, and of which perhaps only two survive. Um, and that's the produce, the offspring for the new generation. Why do only two survive? Simply because the mother uh, or the father bird, um, is, it's impossible for him or her to gather enough food for all of these desperately hungry chicks. And you, you've seen pictures and videos of uh, a, a brood of chicks all pushing each other aside to receive food. Uh, and if the parents are not, uh, um, are not able to find enough food, obviously, and it's a fact of nature, that perhaps six out of eight of them will die and two will survive. Now, if you perform a simple act like putting out healthy, unbelievably nutritious food, because seeds are better than most things that they can find in, you know, in the earth, or you know, foraging, you, find, you give them a, a constant supply of highly nutritious food. They just have to go backwards and forwards from your bird feeder and they can easily sustain all eight chicks. This means that uh, perhaps one year's uh, offspring, may, uh, they may all survive and they may um, produce a healthy set of eight chicklets or chicks and they in turn if a few years later will themselves these eight chicks will um, exponentially uh, you, you see the uh, yeah each generation will increase massively so Hashem's will is that Puru you have made it your will and you have made it your job. It's an unselfish thing. No one tells you go and feed wild birds. But what you are doing, you are demonstrating to Hashem that His will is also your will. You will them to Puru Uru, to be the greatest generational offspring that there can be. So it also ties in with the first Mishnah. These small acts... What is the matan schar of a small act that you don't consider could be great in Hashem's eyes? And in my opinion, some, an act like this deserves, or Hashem delivers, or, or, or deems it, measures it as a great schar. As, and uh, and uh, perhaps, this is, perhaps this is true. Um, and we see, let's continue with the Mishnah. <clears throat> oh, actually, maybe I should step in there. Yeah. While, while you're looking. Um, I, I've seen a very inter interesting um, incident. Well, a story from the Chavetz Chaim. Uh, the Chavetz Chaim himself, he, he had um, children, and he had one child, one son, who was a Talmud Chacham, who passed away in the lifetime of the Chavetz Chaim. It was a very, very sad incident and the Chavetz Chaim himself heard of a, a woman who had also lost a child and he actually quoted this woman at the um, uh, as a eulogy uh, to do with his own son so the Chavetz Chaim said that this woman when she'd lost her son that she said she often prayed to her Kodesh Baruch Hu, saying HaKadosh Baruch Hu, I, when I gave my love, I gave my love for you and for my son. Now that my son is not here, now all my love must go for you. So the Chavz Chaim said on himself, 
Uh, he said, I always wanted to love Hashem with all my heart, Bechol Levavacha. But what can I do? I love my, you know, my, my son as well. But now that my son has passed away, now all of my heart can be focused on loving you. Which is, again, nobody wants to be tested like that in any way, shape or form. But it just shows you uh, how the, uh, if we perform the will uh, of Hashem, then Hashem will, will, will also, by default, will treat your will as if it was His will. And uh, yeah, over to Michael. Okay, so it's beautiful. Um, uh, but just to continue with this Mishnah, uh, it continues with Hillel. Hillel um, now, uh, conti- uh, Hillel replaces Rabbi Gamliel as the author of the next few sayings. So Hillel Omer, al tifrosh min um, um Do not separate yourself from the community. Al ta'amein ba'atzmacha ad yom motcha. Do not trust in yourself until the day of your death. Al tadin al chaverucha al chetagia limkomo ve al ta'oma dava she eev shalishma she sofa le ishma ve al toma. Um, do not judge your fellow man until you have reached his place. Do not say something that cannot be understood, trusting that at the end it will be understood. And finally, say not, when I shall have leisure, I shall study. Perhaps you will not have leisure. So, so for, we'll take the first statement that Hillel Hazokain said, do not separate yourself from the, from the congregation. So Bartonura says, comments on this, but rather share in their troubles, as anyone who separates from the congregation will not live to see the consolation of his congregation. We learn this in Ta'anit, Daf uh, 11, Omid Aleph. Uh, so basically what Bartonura is saying is, you know, being a member of the community is not necessarily about sharing the good times, it's purely about sharing in the bad times. Don't, don't separate yourself from the community. Rambam also talks about this very strongly in the Shemona Purakim. Um, and uh, Rabbeinu Yonah uh, comments about do not separate yourself from the community. At the time when the community is involved with Torah study and with the commandments, it is the crown of all the worlds and all the glory and all of his domain. As with many people that are gathered to fulfill his commandment, it is the king's glory. And so it is not fitting to separate from them. As it says in Devorim chapter 33, Pasuk 5, and there is a king in Yeshurun with the gathering. End quote. And this is with a community that goes in the good path and gathers to do our commandments. But it is not fitting to attach oneself to a community that l- leans to the bad path and the deeds of which are corrupted. And one who separates from them, he is praiseworthy to a community that's corrupted. And about this, Yumiahu, the prophets, said... In Yumiahu chapter 9, verse 1, O oh, to be in the desert at an encampment for wayfarers. O oh, to leave my people, to go away from them, for they are adulterers and a band of rogues. But that's, end quote, but that's only if that community is corrupted. Otherwise, you know, you shouldn't separate yourself from the community under normal circumstances, because it's when the community suffers is when you should be the part in order to support the various members and to... Uh, to be a be a pillar in the community as opposed to ripping a pillar out of the community. And further, um, it, it, now let's look at the next. Do not trust in yourself until the day of your death. Bartonora uh, comments and says, As behold, Yonatan, the high priest, served in the high priesthood 80 years, and in the end he became a Sadducee. Uh, I think it's re- referring it, to Hilkenus, John Hilkenus. Is, is, it, is it Jonathan Yon- or was it y- y- Yishmael Kohen Gadol? No, it says Jonathan. I think that's Hilkenus who, yeah. who eventually became a Sadducee and actually became a very bad man at the end of his life. Yeah. And he, uh, he caused a lot of problems for the Perushim. 
uh, because he became a Sadducee and became mm. quite uh, a virulent <laughs> Sadducee. Yeah, as they normally were. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so what does Rabbeinu Yonah say about um, do not believe in yourself until the day? In other words, what they're saying is um, remain vigilant with your virtues and ethics uh, until the day of your death, because anything can happen. You can be swayed by situations. So you can't say, re- don't rely on the fact that you've built up a good character and you're following certain ethics, because like we see with uh, John Hilkenus, you can switch sides and cause problems to the people you originally were so uh, came from, basically. So Rabbi, Rabbi Yona says about this thing, this is learned out to be both about piety and about faith, that even though you have been fitted with a faithful and proper spirit, you should not be righteous in your own eyes. And you should not say, how many days have I not done so and so sins? I have defeated my impulse and I'm able to overcome it. It is beaten, already broken, and we have escaped. And it cannot divert me from the straight path. But it is an enemy and seeks to ambush you when it finds you sometimes involved in your work and not studying and not thinking about words of the living God. It will then dance in front of you and speak to your heart to divert you to roam around the earth and to walk in a path that no good man has trodden or sat there, referring to the Yetzirah, even more seriously, Satan, who is, unfortunately, according to all sources, you can never truly beat him, and he will always pop up at the time where you think you've beaten them. You have to be vigilant until your dying day. Unfortunately, that's, that's the adversary or your sparring partner uh, that is the Yetzahara. And uh, Rabbeinu Yonah continues, and maybe it can overcome you and your soul will be taken in its hand. And so guard yourself and guard your soul much and do not distance its fear from you and act with your wisdom. If you are a wise man to always place your eyes and your heart upon its ways until it not be able to come close to you all the days of your life. Um, And about this it says, do not believe in yourself until the day of your death. So it's saying the Yetzirah, Uh, Or more seriously, the Satan is ready to pounce at your weakest point and don't think you've beaten him because you, you, uh, it's, it's not possible to, he's always there. But what you must do is don't feed your Yetzirah. When you feed your Yetzirah with Averas, you're strengthening him. You give him the upper hand. What you have to do is you have to pull the plug on him by not committing sins and eventually through your being filled with Hashem's light, you will destroy and extinguish the light of the Yetzirah. Um, and let's continue. Uh, he says, um, do not judge your um, do not judge your fellow man until you have reached his place. In other words, um, don't judge someone else until you have walked in his shoes because we're all when we're critics we all think we're perfect but in reality sometimes when you're in that position that they have committed a certain or acted in a certain way you may find yourself acting in a certain in a certain similar way as Bartonura comments on this statement if you see your fellow come to test and fail do not judge him unfavorably until a test like it comes to you and you overcome it Don't think that you are omnipotent, especially when you're criticizing other people, because given the same circumstances, we're all human, and uh, we can all uh, be weak in certain ways. Uh, What does Rabbeinu Yonah say about this? Uh, Do not judge your fellow until you come to his place. This is also from the topic that a person should not believe in himself and not overly rely on his intellect. And when he sees his fellow in a high position and not act straight, he should not say, if I would fill his place, I would not have done that evil thing from all the evil that he is doing. And And as you don't know, and you are no different from him, being a person, a human being, and perhaps the position would sway you as well. So he's saying, if you if you see a person in a position of power, and you see him perhaps enter the position with a, a, a straight attitude and not not to be corrupted. If he becomes corrupted, don't say, you know what? If I had his job, if I was in a position, I would never 
be corrupted like he would. Perhaps if you were given that position and you were surrounded by people who were offering you bribes the whole time, maybe you would, uh, you know, uh, uh, commit a transgression, become corrupted like that person did. Only when you put yourself in exactly the same situation can you be uh, certain of... Uh, of uh, of your own character and Rabbi Yonah continues only when you reach his place and his position and forego your weaknesses then do you have the right to wonder about his weaknesses it's amazing actually you said that because I'm just thinking <clears throat> that don't judge a fellow unless you put yourself in his, sho- in his shoes you can never ever know all the factors that affect your friend's life so basically you'll never be able to put yourself in his shoes for any practical uh, purpose and therefore don't judge him at all simple as that why, why should you judge him um, also there's another <coughs> point that be- um, bears uh, mentioning here my friend and Chavruta uh, Rabotra Lewis <coughs> mentioned to me that <coughs> in Shemayim uh, after 120 years you will be shown exactly uh, um, what your uh, life challenges were as well as your life benefits your whole peckle that you went through in this world you'll be shown as well as other people and they will figuratively be put on the table you have a peckle of a person's pleasure and a person's pain a person's successes a person's failures and you will give be given the chance to maybe choose uh, the, uh, you know, theoretically, to choose somebody else's life. You thought your life wasn't so good, you can choose somebody else's life. And it's guaranteed that if you had the choice between your, you know, to pick any life with all its uh, successes and failures, you will inevitably end up picking the one that was given to you. So that's one thing that's very important to bear in mind. And it just proves that Hashem gives you exactly what you need to fulfill your life's purpose. He doesn't give you too much, too little. It's always exact. All the tests, all the benefits are all perfectly tailor-made for you by the master of the universe. Very correct. Uh, and so the Mishnah continues. Uh, do not say something that cannot be understood, trusting that in the end it will be understood. So um, basically saying, if you're trying to give someone, uh, someone a, like one of these shiurim, don't try and be too allegorical, hoping that the, that the listener will understand what you're trying, the message you're trying to convey, because it's only the conciseness and electricity that you uh, convey with your message will the listener uh, take that clarity from the message, if that makes sense, if that's clear. Yeah, yeah. But basically, the clearer you, you start make... me on that one, Mark, I'm sorry. <laughs> that's an example yeah. of one not to do. This <laughs> yeah. example of one not to do. Um, basically, be as clear as possible, because sometimes people take what you're saying at face value. They don't understand the intonations that you are perhaps giving in the allegorical facets of your statements and they will be confused by it or they will just not be confused by it they'll just accept it in a different way than you hoped it will be delivered um, so what does uh, what do our uh, commentators say about this Rambam says regarding this about keeping your message clear and easily understood and something that cannot be heard is the simple meaning of the words be very distant and negligible. And only when the person examines them carefully will he see that they are true words. And he warns against this path of speech. As he says, do not have your words require a distant explanation and extra examination. And only then will the listener understand them. And Bartonor comments on this uh, concept saying, that is to say, do not let your words be unclear such that it is impossible to understand them immediately and at first perusal and do not rely upon 
uh, it, that the listener wants to look into them, in the end he will understand them. And this will bring people to error from your words, lest they error and come to heresy because of you. Another explanation that Bartonura brings is, do not reveal your secret, even by saying it aloud only to yourself, as in the end it will be heard. As a quote, since the bird of the sky makes the voice travel. Um, and the correct textual variant, according to this explanation, is, for in the end it will be heard. But Rashi had the variant, do not say something that can be heard, in the end it will be heard. And according to this, it is speaking about the words of Torah. Do not say about a Torah teaching that you can hear now, that you will hear it in the end, but rather extend your ears and hear it immediately. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, one last uh, section of this Mishnah uh, says, Say not, when I shall have leisure, I shall study. Perhaps you will not have leisure. So it's basically telling us to uh, strike, uh, strike the iron while the strike the iron while, while the iron strike the iron hot. Yeah. Uh, this is very important because you may not have time in the future to uh, to. We all say, you know, um, I'll leave it a little bit later. Yeah. Uh, but in the end, you may not have any time. It could come down to another practical idea in that, um, let's say you've got two tasks on a specific day or specific hour, and it's a toss-up between the two. Always go for the mitzvah as opposed to the chulin if you can. That's that's my personal opinion. Um, put the Torah, put the Torah first. Like I, could, I, I, I have to go to a shir, or I have to attend to this duty. And it doesn't make a difference which will come first. Always put the Torah first because you never know. Uh, maybe Hashem will, will also give you Siyat Deshma and let you do the uh, the um, mundane task in super quick time. That's called Kavitza Taderech. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, Michael. That's a um, very interesting episode. I, I, I like your little insights there. So that's it for this uh, particular Mishnah. Next time we convene, we will be doing Mishnah 6, Bezran Hashem. Until then, have a fantastic and wonderful week.